Hi, so this is Greg. Um, I'm here today with Russ White. That's Russ White. Say hi. 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 So <laughs> we've been, I'm here at the IETF conference and I was cornered Russ and so I, I thought we would just talk a little bit. I know that many of you have seen him on the podcast or more correctly heard of him on the podcast and this is what he looks like in real life. He's about as pretty as I am. <laughs> Don't you see the corner away He's got with a, all the nerd gear behind us? Right, so you're here at the ITF and you're still doing protocol design and architectures and routing architectures and things like that. Um, and I know you were just talking, we're going to do some live podcasts, some audio podcasts, some Packet Pushes podcasts on the open fabric stuff. Now, you talked a little bit about it earlier today. Basically, what you're talking about is using ISIS as a way of propagating configuration information through the network. Well, actually, just for um, an open fabric, the idea is to not have configuration. So basically, yes. what the ISIS pieces do is just giving you reachability. It's not right. giving you anything other than reachability like no policy or anything just like so when you say be- policy what do you mean do you mean like traffic engineering filters path selections anything like that so just self discovery is almost like a it's like a, a cdp lldp kind of thing yes plus routing plus routing Which and so, labels. so simplifying what currently is done in multiple protocols like cdp lldp plus ethernet setups e- what about bfd well, you still need BFD because that's a silicon feature. Well, that depends on what you're doing. Most of the time, if you're not running a chassis box, you don't necessarily need BFD because you don't hmm. have the, the big. The big thing you get from BFD out of a out of a data center in a data center environment hmm. is just um, light failures. Like okay, weird, optical, weird, yeah, yeah weird, unidirectional like, failures. Unidirectional failures. So the transmit like, fiber goes out, but the receive right. fiber still works, so you have exactly. this asymmetric detection process right. going on. That's the primary thing you get out of BFD in a, in okay, a, in right. a, in a data center fabric, so, because everything else is point-to-point. Point. There's no multi-point. So the thing about ISIS, for those of you who don't know, is that it doesn't use IP as a transport protocol. It uses PDUs. That's right. Dots so back to the days of OSI. So it doesn't yes, use IP. It's, a, it's its own Ethernet protocol number just like IP is. Yeah, so it's it kind of is a layer 2 protocol but it's actually a layer 3 protocol. It is a layer 3 protocol, it's just yes. not IP. Yeah, okay. It's its own thing. And it's in its own Ethernet Yes, it's in number. its own Ethernet number, yeah. frame type and Could, everything else, yes. Right, so that means that two systems when they're adjacent can discover each other because there's only two people listening on that That's Ethernet right. number. It actually means you don't even need IP addressing on the link to discover. So actually, um, so that's auto configuration then, because yes. if I don't need to have two IP addresses, that's I can exactly right. I can so build I can a actually mesh. build the entire fabric and yep. the entire link state database with no IP addresses. I don't even care about IP addresses. So you're talking about building a leaf spine type of architecture, an ECMP leaf spine or yeah. multi stage. You know, mm-hmm. Could be three, yeah, five, three, five, five, five is typically what. And you just start plugging things in, and they'll start self configuring. Yeah. If and so, they, so they discover the fabric, and once they discover the shape of the so fabric... They, so no, let's, let's take a second. So, so if I turn it on, they've got ISIS. These two things are going to start sending out PDUs, and they're going to discover each other. Yeah. So you're enhancing the basic ISIS, because normally you have to have a router ID for ISIS. No, you would still have a router ID, yeah. but the router ID is not an IP address. The router ID is an ISO address. So an ISO address is actually formed like a V6 address. Hmm. So you're actually taking your MAC address, and you're hmm. taking some other header on that MAC address, which right. can be auto-configured, right. yep. or just... Whatever, right? But it you can, can randomly create a router ID. You don't need to manually create one. Yes, you don't need to. So manually I don't have create. to pre-configure that. I can literally take a switch, put it in, plug it in, and it will automatically configure with this open fabric. Yes, in ISOs. fact, there's a draft uh, that just RFC'd about how to conf- how to build that ISO ID. Right. Without any configuration, based on information on the local box, and it just works. So now all of a sudden I've got. So let's let's break it down. So I've got a box. Take a box out. Start plugging them in willy nilly. Mm-hmm. I can discover who my neighbor is. My ISIS routing instance sets up its own router ID and says, oh, I can start to see my neighbors. Now I'm going to have to start capturing IP configuration, uh, routing information. No, no, even before you get there. Yeah. Even before you get there, you can actually build an SPF tree. Yes. Because now everybody can send their LSPs, which yep. contain no IP information at all. They at just contain point, PDU. They just contain PD, They just contain the, the type 2 or the type 22, whatever it is, yeah. that actually tells you about whose router ID is connected to who. So, right. So it just connects router IDs, right? So, then you so now you've got tree. a topology. Now I have a topology. Right. And I have no IP yet. Right. I just have topology. Hmm. So now, based on that topology, I can actually use some... Uh, some different calculations to actually discover where I am in topology. I actually ah. know if I'm a top of rack switch or so if I'm a So this is the self-configuration part. Yes. Right? So now once I know that, then my top of rack switch can go, well, you know what, I need IP addresses. Yep, yep. So now I can just reach out and touch a configuration server 
find out where my address yeah. address pool should be. So a configuration server would be like an SDN controller, right. perhaps, or type yep. of function? Exactly. Some sort of software defined? Yep, that's exactly right. Right, and it would say, oh, you're in this architecture, you must fit into this point of the ECMP. That's right. So therefore now I need to, I need to hand you an IP address pool to do Slack or to do DHCP or whatever it is. So now I start plugging devices into that top of rack right. switch, right. and they can use DHCP or Slack or whatever and grab their IP addresses, and I can actually route through the fabric. Oh. And as of yet, I still don't have any IP addresses necessarily. Right. So I can I mean, build I can... my whole L2 architecture, just plug it all together, and then I reach out to a configuration server and start. Yep. My IP addressing information is given to me in some form, yep. derived from the configuration server, and I guess the Open Fabric standard talks about this? No, it doesn't, actually. Yeah. This is kind of separate from the Open Fabric piece. So the Open Fabric piece is still just the ISO. Just the ISO. Does it, it sounds a little bit like Trill, that self-configuring, fast convergence. It is, but it's layer 3. Right. So Trill was all about carrying MAC addresses right. and, this and is a routing IP, protocol. IPv6, IPv4. And this is all, so it would be even simpler than Trill, because yes. Trill's problem was it had to scale very large to carry well, MAC addresses. Well, and database. Trill's problem is also that it wants to be able to intersperse standard spanning tree switches with our bridges. Ah, right, yes. Right, we don't have that problem. So there's no gateways between the legacy and the future. Right, Trill exactly. had that problem where our bridges was trying to connect to the legacy spanning trees as well as the... That's exactly ISIS right. ISIS spine that right. Trill and I don't have to do any of that. You just have to say it's all mine. So you're pretending right. the entire legacy is just legacy. That's exactly right. Right. Which and is which by the way is perfect because something that I've been going on about for a very long period of time is try not to keep holding on to your legacy, try and build a pod. Right? That's right. A core pod architecture. That's exactly so right. So if the you know there's no reason to keep uh, running around in that. modularization. What modularization? was that? A long time ago, I heard that word, and I don't know what it means. Well, you can always build another <laughs> network. You can build one of these ECMP spines over here, yeah. and then route it back to what's that's over here, that's right? That's exactly So right. just have an L3 gateway that hooks back over to there. That's and exactly. Okay. And so you can use link local addressing, yeah. right, to get your IP in. And then you can actually auto-configure V6 addresses if you want to. Yeah. But you don't need to advertise any of the links. We the links don't need IP addresses except yeah. for troubleshooting. Yes, except for right. troubleshooting. Because yes. if you want to do a trace mm -hmm. route, but in these environments you shouldn't be using trace routes. Well, the right. problem with trace route in these environments is when you start talking about 32 and 16 way ECMP and, and the span out levels, trace route doesn't do you any good anyway. Exactly, 16 way. Which one? You right. So, <laughs> so, so so every time you trace route, it's going to take a different path. Right. So pings pointless. Yes. <laughs> so, whatever that. Whatever, whatever that, that means. Does, yeah. So, so you really need to have some sort of SDN engine on top to monitor all of these links and to start extract value. So what That's you're exactly. saying is instead of there's no longer just one best and only path that you care about, yeah. there's 16 possible paths that are all best paths. That's exactly right. Therefore, traceroute and ICMP becomes pointless. Yes. So now you need to be thinking, well, I have to have an SDN that monitors the state of all 16 links. Right. I'm going to have to have a controller that overlays the whole thing anyway. Yep. So rather than having any of that policy in the routing protocol, make the routing protocol really, really simple. Take it right there down. one thing. So it doesn't provide any APIs to the SDN. That's all taken care of mm, with something else. That right. would be BFD or LLDP or... Right, uh, PSAP or ITRS, Yang models, Yang models or something. Yes. Something, whatever it is your, whatever, your favorite API whatever for your abstraction favorite API is. is. That's exactly right. So what's your view on these APIs for abstraction in Yang models? Are we making headway or is it, are we ground uh, bogged down in kind of like the process now? Um, boy, wow. <laughs> I know you're not, you don't seem to be heavily involved in the Yang models part. I mean, we'll, we'll talk to you. I'm in, I'm in I2RS yeah. a good bit, and I think I2RS is probably a really good solution. Yeah. The question is, how do you transport I2RS? How do you actually get it to the router? Do you use something like PSAP, which doesn't really carry Yang model, so now you've got to grind in that direction, or do you do um, something like RESTCOMP, which could be too heavy weight for this scale, yeah. or do you, um, how do you, I mean, what do you Open do config, with this? Open config, GRPC. Yeah, yeah what, how, GRPC, what do you do with this? And so that's kind of the problem we're facing right now, is trying to figure out how to actually transport, what's the south of, what's not the southbound API necessarily, because that's easy enough, you just use Yang. Mm, mm. Okay, right, but how do I actually transport to those boxes? How does that piece scale? Yes. Yeah. How does that work? And, you know, open if you're going to issue flow, thousands and thousands of Yang model requests per hour to get yes. configuration data, like they're now talking about the session yeah, I just came yeah, from, yeah. they're saying the right way to do a Yang model is there's a state Yang model and there's a configuration Yang model. So if you want to poll the ephemeral, Yang engine. Yeah, yeah, there's ephemeral state, there's non-ephemeral state, there's ephemeral config and non-ephemeral config. Yeah. And that becomes very confusing and very difficult to figure out how to actually model that. Two is there's two things that come out of that. One is the models become simpler because if you're building a state model, then this is just for give me right. the state, right? Right, right, And right. I could also see that internally to the software architecture, you could optimize state model delivery or request as read-only. 
Yeah. Because effectively you're querying state. But if I receive a config model yes. and I'm trying to change the config, then I might want to put that through a different software pathway internally. Right. And then there's the issue of how much validation do you need to do? For instance, if I'm writing something to the rib, I don't really need to do a lot of validation on it yeah. because it's a ri- it's just a route. Right. Whereas if I'm and actually the Yang model cha- forces the validation. Right. Yeah. Whereas if I'm writing to BGP, yes, I may actually want to back check the rest of the BGP configuration before I write that in to make sure I'm not going to blow my BGP session up. Yeah. Well, now there's a different levels of validation. What you you're talking it? about there is the difference between a static route, just putting a route straight in to mm-hmm. then loads forwards into the TCAM or the forwarding plane, yep. as opposed to configuring the BGP to add a new neighbor right. and accept routes from a neighbor. Exactly. There's different levels of validation there. Yeah. that become problematic. How now you're you talking deal with yeah, that? To, uh, in both ends, in the model itself and in the device. Yes, that's exactly So the right. device itself should do valid, validation checks on the inbound query, even though the Yang model might have been formed externally? Exactly. Yeah. So, or not, as the case may be. Or not, as the yeah. case may be. If so you get, but if you let that get too elastic, if you let the model, if you let the SDN controller give you rubbish, you could have unpredictable consequences. Yes. So that's a challenge. Garbage in, garbage out. Well... And we're, but we've always been. <laughs> the thing is, though, is that we've always been very tolerant about what we accept. Right? Network engineers, rope. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> foot guns. <laughs> you can hang yourself Here's if a gun. you want to. Pointed at my foot. All you have to do is pull the trigger. That's right. Yeah. Good luck. Well, this is where. I, but I, I like that idea because the further we get away from that old idea of be tolerant in what we accept, but rigid in what we force people to program, we need to get away from that idea because that let people be lazy about what they send. Yeah, yeah that, right. that's 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 an issue. And that bred, you know, vendor implementations where they did very little sanity checking. They didn't control what the vendors. developers would write, and then they would accept anything at the other end, I and then vendors became what's, somebody. What's, what's a vendor? <laughs> Sorry, is that a legacy concept? For you it's now? a legacy concept. <laughs> <laughs> is that part of your legacy network as well? That you trying to <laughs> B word. <laughs> Use that B word. So open fabric, that's a really interesting idea. So taking a legacy protocol, what I would perceive as a legacy protocol, and then rebirthing it as something new. Sometimes yeah. I'm very, my, my backs get up. Like they're talking, I've just come from a session on network slicing, and they're talking about using BGP to do the network slicing configuration. We of, just, BGP is just, is just the garbage can of choice right now. It is, absolutely. And I was just sitting there shaking my head and going like, why would you use BGP as a data bus? To configure containers for network services. Because everybody knows how to configure a BGP neighbor. Yeah. Like <laughs> or, or more importantly <laughs> because they're so morally they're so intellectually bankrupt they can't imagine using like a, a proper piece of software to communicate. Like you know, like zero MQ or a message bus like Rabbit MQ or something, right? Like there are entire Kafka. <laughs> no. Any of those, right? Actually actually we, do should, know, we, we should do that. Yeah. We should do Kafka over BGP. That would be entertaining. <laughs> 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 Zero of Q over that would BGP. Could, well, it couldn't get any worse than the SPF over BGP. <laughs> BGP link state, where they're yeah. trying to shoehorn our SPF into BGP. Because, you know, let's face it, it should have a kitchen sink. Like, the kitchen sink's not finished until it's got SPF, surely. So, 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 my, so my issue with that is primarily not that it's actually being done. It's yeah. that um, instead of thinking of things as opaque data and yeah. bu- building a new message and just saying, okay, the underlying transport for BGP is a message bus. Hmm. I mean, we did this with the Edge European. Hmm. That the underlying transport is just a message bus. You can carry IPv6, IPv4, you can carry whatever you want to. Hmm. It, it, the same thing with ISI is very much that layer three protocol that it sits on top of, that sits in, or layer three protocol that sits on top of the internet brand is basically just a message bus. It's just a yeah. flooded yeah. message bus. That's all it is. And so we just happen to stick TLVs in it. Well, BGP has the same thing. There is an underlying message message bus in BGP yeah. that rides on top of TCP. BGP is many things, one of which is a message bus, right. the other one which is a protocol right. for selecting the best possible right. exactly. routing entry, and another one which is database. Yeah. It's also a database because right. it defines a database in which the route entries Right, are. right. So, but, but what we tend to do is we tend to take and we say, well, look at all this beautiful database stuff we have. Let's stick another AFI in there, mm. and we'll stick all the information in an AFI. But there's a message bus underneath it yeah. that you could actually create a new message and just actually have BGP carry the stuff without it actually impacting the AFIs or anything else but we don't ever do that we just like oh yeah. look just there's an AFI that's people an don't stop and m- think about the actual purpose purposes so yeah. I like to think of my routing protocols as as chunks of functionality and OSPF consists of a database it consists of a message parsing algorithm between neighbors yep. and it consists of a, an algorithm that will select the best route yes. yeah right so you've got those three parts are there any other parts that I'm missing neighbor uh, discovery, neighbor discovery yeah, so there's an algorithm like around yeah, neighbor yeah, yeah. discovery 
Uh, it's really just those four that I yeah, think. Yeah, I think yeah. that's pretty much it. It's a fairly simple piece of software as far yeah. as it goes. It really right. is not that difficult to create. Four, right. Only four, four MOS. Right, when I so started at Cisco, the yeah. OSPF was under 10K lines of code. Yep. So really in reality, you could use any routing protocol as a bus on the understanding that if I put it in here, you just pass the message, but you don't have to invoke the protocol. That's exactly or right. Or whatever. You could just create some sort of link state that goes into an SPF or an ISS. In fact, I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you an entertaining yeah. story. Yeah, okay. We, at one time, um, a few of us in Cisco actually decided to replace IBGP. Hmm. And all we did was took the BGP LS, uh, TLVs and stuffed them into ISIS as yeah. a transport. <laughs> okay, yeah. And they just flood. Yes. Right? Yep. They yep. just flood. They flood, yeah. And that's it. And that's all you do. I mean, you don't have to do anything else. You just take the BGP TLVs out of yes. TCP, and instead of putting them in TCP, you just shove them in ISIS as an LSP. Mm. And the oh, LS, and flood. then you're using ISIS as a message bus. Yes. Between BGP peers. Yep. And, and then internally, just flood. Yep. yeah. Minimum configuration. Minimum configuration. I know you, you do love your ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not using ISIS to solve every problem just because you like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it was really easy actually just to do it that way. In fact, originally yeah. the idea was to put BGP into the EIGRP message bus. Yes, yeah. It, well, EIGRP as a message bus actually wasn't too bad because exactly. it's a. Uh, it's even slim, simpler. It's even yeah. str more stripped down than yes, ISIS. It is. In fact, it's really, really simple in multicast in things like that. When yeah. you get into the way it works with multicast, it's true. Yeah, I'd never thought about it like that. So, so, but there was a big pushback against that because, of course, it was the edge European on standard, blah 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 yeah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, ISIS code yeah. is generally written with the message bus as a separate module, unlike OSPF, which yeah. tends to draw the tends message to glom bus, it all, glom it all yeah, together. Yeah. So it was just easy just to take the BGP TLV, stuff them in ISIS. And poof, it just floods. Oh, well, that was easy. <laughs> well, as we get towards wrapping up this very quick YouTube video that we're just recording as we between sessions, anything else you want to talk about? No, not really. Where can people find you on the internet? Oh, rule11.tech or packet pushers. I write there sometimes. And, uh, but mostly rule11.tech is the easiest place to find me. Um, look out for some more videos coming up in the near future. And uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>